Today I want to talk to you about owning individual stocks. And no, I'm not going to tell you how to do it successfully, this is not that kind of channel. I have talked in past videos about the difference between systematic and non-systematic risk. Systematic risk is a risk that cannot be diversified away. Market risk is a systematic risk, as are the risks of small cap and value stocks. These are the risks that we are stuck with, but they are also compensated risks. We expect a positive outcome for taking on these undiversifiable risks. Non-systematic risk is the risk of an individual stock or bond. This type of risk can be easily diversified away using low-cost index funds. Since this is a type of risk that can be easily diversified away, it is not a compensated risk. You do not reasonably expect a long-term positive outcome for betting on a single security. Despite this, many people still choose to irrationally hold large positions in individual stocks. I'm Ben Felix, Associate Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. In this episode of Common Sense Investing, I'm going to tell you why individual stocks are even riskier than you might think. Before I start the episode, I do want to let everyone know that I've started a weekly podcast called The Rational Reminder. It's a reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making for Canadians, hosted by my PWL Capital colleague, Cameron Passmore. If you enjoy my common sense investing videos, I think that you will really like the podcast. I've put links to The Rational Reminder in the description below. Let's talk about individual stock ownership. I think that on one hand, everyone knows that it is not sensible to own individual stocks, but on the other hand, everyone has a bit of an itch to speculate. That itch to speculate is driven by a handful of biases that are not always easy to spot or to overcome. I get it. I have seen people get rich quickly by investing in crazy assets like Bitcoin, tech stocks, and cannabis stocks. That is a real thing that has happened to some people, and it is one of the things that makes it really hard for everyone else to ignore the potentially positive outcome. We will come back to the distribution of outcomes later, and I think you will want to stick around or at least skip ahead to hear about it. But it is important to understand that stock prices are random. When someone is successful in speculating, it should almost certainly be attributed to luck. The problem with that, though, is it never feels like luck when it happens. There is a massive opportunity for confirmation bias, which means that people take the random outcome of a stock going up and they attribute it to their prior belief that it would go up. Now, not everyone who speculates on individual stock is a savvy trader. I think that one of the most common cases for concentrated positions in an individual stock is probably people who have received equity packages from their employer. That specific case results in a handful of biases that apply to all investors being extra strong for employees who hold stock in their employer. It is extremely easy to confuse familiarity with safety. When you know the long-term plans of your company and the leadership treats you like family, it is a lot harder to objectively assess the risks of owning the stock. This may be especially true when the price of a stock has gone up over time. In a 2001 paper titled Excessive Extrapolation and the Allocation of 401k Accounts to Company Stock, Shlomo Benartzi found that employees of firms that experienced the worst stock performance over the trailing 10 years allocate 10.37% of their discretionary contributions to company stock, where employees whose firms experience the best stock performance allocate 39.7%. I don't think that I need to remind any of you that past performance is not a good indicator of future performance. Any investor that owns an individual stock is overconfident, but this is probably even more true when you're holding a large position in your employer company's stock. Not only do you believe in the company, but you feel like you have an impact. This is overconfidence bias combined with an illusion of control that makes it really, really hard to understand that your thoughts, feelings, and hard work have nothing to do with your company's share price. Illusion of control can affect other investors too. If you have put a lot of time and effort into researching the potential outcomes of a trade, you may feel, irrationally, that you are in control of the probability of the outcome. This is almost never true. Whether they are an employee of a company or not, investors have a strong tendency to overvalue assets that they already own. This is called the endowment effect, which was popularized by Kahneman, Nooch, and Thaler in a 1991 paper 
anomalies, the endowment effect, loss aversion, and status quo bias. It is well documented that investors are less willing to part with an asset that they own, even if they would not buy that asset at its current price. Say you bought a stock for $5 per share and it increased in price to $50. Would you sell it or would you keep it? Many people would keep it, but would not buy more at the current high price. This is not rational. If you would not buy more at the current price, you should not keep it. A good way to check the endowment effect is to ask yourself, if you had the value of your shares in cash, would you buy the shares? Frame this way, most people will change their mind. I doubt this information is new to anyone, but even when we are aware that we are being irrational, we tend to overweight the likelihood of positive outcomes while underweighting the probability of extremely negative outcomes. What's an extremely negative outcome? Nortel, Enron, Lehman, Bear Stearns. Those are just some big names I picked to make the point that stocks can go to zero, but there are many, many others that you probably haven't heard of. It is possible, and not at all unheard of, for companies to disappear taking their share price with them. While it can happen, I do agree that a total loss seems unlikely. Much more likely is underperforming the market over time or suffering a permanent loss. In a May 2018 paper titled, Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills? Hendrik Bessembinder of Arizona State University demonstrated that the vast majority of stocks that have appeared in the Center for Research in Security Prices database, which is a comprehensive database of US stocks, since 1926, have lifetime buy and hold returns less than one month treasury bills. In other words, you would have been better off taking no risk with your capital than investing in most individual stocks. What does most mean? It means that the best performing 4% of listed companies explain the returns of the entire US stock market since 1926. The remaining 96% of stocks, collectively, match the returns of treasury bills. That means that you would have been better off taking no risk at all than holding 96% of the individual stocks in the US since 1926. I'd call your chances of picking a winning stock pretty bad. That is called skewness. The data only get worse the deeper we get. Only 42.6% of the nearly 26,000 common stocks that have appeared in the CRISP database from 1926 to 2016 have a lifetime buy and hold return greater than the one month treasury bill over the same period. The rates of underperformance are highest for small cap stocks and for stocks that have entered the database in recent decades. Eugene Fama and Kenneth French had a 2004 paper addressing the second point. They demonstrated that starting in the 1980s, weaker firms with less profitability and more distant future payoffs were listing on exchanges, leading to lower new list survival rates. Based on this, it would be reasonable to expect that the discouraging skewness of the past will be even more pronounced in the future. A bit of underperformance doesn't sound so bad, right? If you want to speculate, you know you are taking risk. Unfortunately, it's not typically just a bit of underperformance that you should expect. A 2014 study from JP Morgan looked at data going back to 1980 for the S&P 500, the Russell 3000, and a handful of specific sectors. Most telling is the data on the Russell 3000 companies, which encompasses most of the US market. The study shows that of the 13,000 stocks that were included in the Russell 3000 index between 1980 and 2014, 40% of them suffered a decline of 70% or more from their peak value without a significant recovery. You heard that correctly. 40% of companies included in the index at some point between 1980 and 2014 had suffered a 70% decline from their peak value, recovering to, at best, a permanent 60% decline in value from their peak. Those catastrophic losses are more frequent for certain industries, like information technology with a 57% catastrophic loss rate, telecommunications at 51%, and energy at 47%. The study goes on to explain that these losses do not only happen during recessions or market corrections. They are happening steadily all of the time. It also explains that two-thirds of all excess returns versus the Russell 3000 index were negative, and 40% of all stocks had negative absolute returns. This means that 67% of stocks underperformed the index over the period, and 40% had negative returns. I do not think that this data is what people have in mind when they buy or hold an individual stock. They see the glamour of all of the money that they are going to make, and while they may on some level understand that it is a risky bet, 
I doubt that most people understand how badly the odds are stacked against them. Historically, you are far more likely to pick a loser than a winner. And that loser is highly likely to not only trail the index, but to have negative absolute returns. Today we have talked about the biases that make you falsely believe that owning individual stocks is a good idea, and we have talked about how badly the vast majority of individual stocks have performed over time. If you still have a hankering to maintain exposure to individual stocks, I, I don't know what to say. Do you irrationally hold positions in individual stocks? Tell me all about it in the comments. Thanks for watching. My name is Ben Felix of PWL Capital, and this is Common Sense Investing. I will be talking about a new common sense investing topic every two weeks, so subscribe, click the bell for updates. If you enjoy my Common Sense Investing series, don't forget to check out the Rational Reminder podcast, which is available on Libsyn, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. Links in the notes.